in this session, what I'm going to do in this teaching is, is I'm continuing in the eternal blueprint overview. And this is uh, part four. As I'm going through the different parts in the book, the eternal blueprint here, this book, we're summarizing it, going through it, is part four is the gospel and ultimate intention. And uh, the, the, the basic summary of this is the work of the cross is the cornerstone of most gospel presentations, and rightfully so. I mean, it's at the corner of it, cornerstone of everything we do, but what happens is most believers commonly fail to connect God's, you know, the work of the cross back to God's ultimate intention. And so what we're going to do in this session is look at how the work of the cross and the way of the cross lead us back to God's ultimate intention. And I, you know, just most of you know this, but some of you who don't, I grew up in a denominational church. I grew up in a traditional denominational church, moderately fundamental. And, you know, we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And, and every time the doors were open, thank the Lord, we were at church. And so I just remember back when I was in the fourth grade and the, the pastor was preaching and that was back when, you know, churches talked more about hell and, you know, it wasn't really a hell, fire and brimstone type message, but it really was the fear of God was on me. And as they sang, the church sang, just as I am, I remember sitting back in the very back row, white knuckling it, just like, I can't, I've, you know, the Lord just moving me to go up there and I'm trying to fight it. And finally I said, okay, I am going to go up there. I am going to give my life to Jesus Christ. And I did. And I, I was, it was a dramatic transformation. I mean, I, I, something, the Lord came into me at that moment and saved me. I don't have, I didn't know all the language that I know today, but I was, I was saved at that in the fourth grade at the age of 10. And then, you know, growing up in that type of denominational church, if you ever grew up in that kind of denominational church, you get saved every single week. I mean, there's such a fear of hell that, you know, you get saved at the evangelistic crusade. You get saved at the retreat. You get saved when they show the rapture videos. Or you get saved, you know, when, you know, hell's gates, heaven flames, or whatever it would be. You would get saved over and over and over and over and over. But finally, when I knew I was in and I knew I was saved and I had said the sinner's prayer, you know, 375 times, and finally it registered, okay, I really am saved, I don't have to fear, then the, sh the focus shifted, okay, now it's time to serve. Now, we are definitely called to serve, I talked about that just a minute ago, but the, the common paradigm is that we were saved to serve. We're saved to serve. Once you're saved, once you're in, then you need to do what good Christians do. Good Christians go to church every time the doors open. Good Christians read the Bible. Good Christians pray. Good Christians tithe. Good Christians go on mission trips. Really good Christians go into full-time ministry. And that was the paradigm we operated in. Now, all those things are great things, and the Lord leads us to do all those things. But the mentality was, okay, now that you're in, now that you're saved, then what? Then what? That you've basically hit God's ultimate intention, and because you've hit God's ultimate intention, then what? And so the, the paradigm was that, that everything is, is viewed through the lens of God's, or, or everything is viewed through the lens of salvation. All the scriptures are read through the lens of salvation. Everything is, you know, read through, you know, what must you do to get saved kind of paradigm, and we don't see and we miss God's ultimate intention. In fact, when I, after, when I was about 19 years old, I went on a radical pursuit of the Lord. I, I followed the Lord wholeheartedly, you know, reading books and listening to sermons and, you know, anything and everything. I mean, I studied like I've never studied before. I was just so hungry to learn and to know the, the, the truth and to know the Lord. And I, I probably, I don't know if I ever even heard of how, I mean, ever heard the connection between God's eternal purpose and the gospel. The gospel and God's eternal purpose. There was no connection between the gospel and God's ultimate intention. It was basically, you are, you are, the ultimate intention of God was to be saved. And then that was it. Once I discovered, started discovering God's ultimate intention, and we went th through that in part one, I realized that the gospel is not God's ultimate intention. The gospel is the means to get us into God's ultimate intention. It's a very big shift 
the majority of the church needs. Most of the church still believes God's ultimate intention is to save us. And it's not to save us. Salvation has become necessary because of the fall, because of Adam's sin, because of Adam's choice. But salvation was never God's ultimate intention. Salvation is the means to God's ultimate intention. And so we're going to talk about today the finished work of the cross and the way of the cross so that we can understand the finished work of the cross and the way of the cross lead us to God's ultimate intention. And so that's going to be our focus here in this, this teaching is if you think about it, and this is probably not something a lot of us have thought about, but if you think about it, if the fall had not occurred, 99% of what the church focuses on today would not even need to exist. Think about that. Think about the messages. Think about the songs. Think about all that is proclaimed. If the fall had not occurred, if Adam would have eaten from the tree of life, 99% of what is preached in the church today wouldn't have no reason for it to be preached. Have you ever thought about that? Because Adam would have eaten of the tree of life. The life of God would have been implanted to him, and that life of God would have then been transferred through subsequent generations. But see, we, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, we, you know, desperately need the finished work of the cross, but we need to view it in, through the lens of God's ultimate intention. The, the work of the cross and the way of the cross are the means to lead us to God's ultimate intention. And, you know, we talked about in part one, just, you know, five blueprint or five components of God's eternal purpose. And I'm just going to list a couple of them right now. But in terms of God's inheritance, the Father created us so that we would become his mature Christ-like sons. Having the life of Christ in fullness being possessed by his life, being a representation of the man, Jesus Christ, not just individually, but corporately, we would become that corporate representation of the man, Jesus Christ. Not only that, but the son has an inheritance in the saints. He will have an equally yoked bride that has been made ready for him. And not only that, the Spirit of God has an inheritance in the saints. He will have a body that he fills, a house that he dwells in, and a temple that he possesses. See, that, that is where everything God's working towards. Now, salvation is the means to get us to that end, but it's not the ultimate intention. It's a paradigm shift that the church desperately, desperately needs to make. So let's talk for a minute about just we're going to summarize real quick the work of the cross and ultimate intention and the way of the cross and ultimate intention. See, when Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished, all that was of the Edemic race, all that was of Adam and all who are in Adam, which would be every single human that's ever been born, all that was of Adam was nailed to Jesus Christ on the cross and it, when Jesus was crucified, the sin of Adam and all his descendants, including everyone who's ever lived, was nailed with Jesus Christ on the cross, and Jesus said, it is finished. The Edemic race was dealt a death blow being crucified with Jesus Christ. See, what the last Adam finished in, on the cross See, what the last Adam accomplished on the cross is, you know, took care of what everything the first Adam did in the garden. When Jesus said, it is finished, it took care of everything, the, the condemnation, the guilt, all of the sin of man, every perversion was nailed to Jesus Christ on the cross. It dealt with it thoroughly and absolutely. That is the work of the cross. The work of the cross, it determines, see, when we are in Jesus Christ and we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the work of the cross determines our legal position because of covenant. Because of covenant, because Jesus is our, our new covenant representative, all that, all that what happened to Jesus, all that Jesus is, was then imputed to us. Meaning that the way God looks at it, God sees us in Jesus Christ. God sees us 
righteous. God sees us crucified. God sees us buried. God sees us dead. God sees us resurrected. This is your legal position because of the finished work of the cross. See, that means that now we are in Jesus Christ. We are the righteousness of God in him. In Jesus Christ, we have died to sin, died to self, died to the law. Now, that hasn't actually become experiential yet. But when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that legal position is now true of us. See, through when God looks at you, he looks at you through Jesus Christ. He sees that Christ was crucified. You in him were crucified. You are righteous. Christ is righteous. You in him are righteous. You see what I'm saying? That is your legal position. It is a powerful truth. We're going to get into it in a minute. But the work of the cross, when we connect it to God's eternal purpose, the work of the cross restores us to the place where Adam would have been if he had eaten of the tree of life instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, the work of the cross restores us back to, or, or the, yeah, the work of the cross restores us back to where Adam would have been had he eaten of the tree of life. But the way of the cross, and that's what we're going to talk about now, the way of the cross is different than the work of the cross. The way of the cross is what the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is finishing in us. See, the work of the cross is what Jesus finished for us. The way of the cross is what the Holy Spirit is finishing in us. One is a position. One, the other is an experience. One is what you're declared to be and constituted to be and that God sees you as. The other is a living reality actualized in real experience by the Holy Spirit. And so the way of the cross is how what Jesus finished for us on the cross is actualized in our daily experience. See, if all we do is we know our legal position, it does not give us much practical victory in our struggle with self and sin. We need more we definitely need to know about the finished work of the cross, but we need more than that. We also need the Holy Spirit to bring us into that daily true experience where not only were we positionally crucified with Christ, but the cross of Jesus Christ is actively working in our soul and our self-life to make us one with him, not just in uh, legal terms, but in actual reality. Making sense? So let's, let's talk just a little bit about the difference between, or let me just say this. We're going to talk about the, the work of the cross in a little bit more detail because, we're, we're again, we're looking at how the gospel relates to God's ultimate intention. And so you know the story of Adam when he ate the forbidden fruit. What happened to Adam and what happened to every person after him in Adam, every, everyone ever born is in Adam, guilt, shame, and condemnation has come in and defiled and tarnished our souls. Every person who's ever lived struggles with guilt, shame, and condemnation. And see, God's great eternal plan and purpose to bring us into the very fellowship that the Godhead has enjoyed forever as his mature Christ-like sons, as the bride of Jesus Christ, that very eternal plan and purpose that God ordained, what, one of the greatest barriers to that is guilt, shame, and condemnation. When we feel like God is always mad at us, when we feel like our sin has defined us, when we feel like our shame has you know, made us who we are, and, and that just we carry that with us, that is the ultimate barrier to intimacy with God. And so one of the first things God had to deal with on the cross of Jesus Christ is he had to deal with guilt, shame, and condemnation. That is so vital, I and mean, I see it all the time, believers struggling with guilt, struggling with shame, struggling with condemnation. And yet Romans 8.1 says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Now, that obviously does not mean we can do whatever we want. That does not mean we can sin 
and live in sin like, like Paul was accused of preaching? You know, were you saying that, you know, sin let sin increase so grace can abound? And Paul's like, God forbid that. That's not what we're talking about. But I know until guilt, shame, and condemnation have been dealt with in your life and you have experienced liberty from guilt, shame, and condemnation, you can never have intimacy with God. See, the first thing Adam did when he sinned is he ran away from God. Instead of running to God, he ran from God. Guilt, shame, and condemnation are such a yoke we carry that it keeps us from intimacy with God. And so for the Lord to bring us into his eternal purpose, the finished work at the cross had to do six, six things. And we're going to talk about these really quick because they're all in the book, The Eternal Blueprint. But Number one, and we sing about this this morning, is the blood of Jesus satisfies God. The blood of Jesus satisfies God. And if the blood of Jesus satisfies God, then the blood of Jesus needs to satisfy us. See, don't be defined by what was done to you or by you. Be defined by what Jesus did for you. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from all of your sins. That is an incredible truth. That is and it's something we need to just, just soak in all the time. The blood of Jesus has satisfied God. Let the blood of Jesus satisfy you. And what I mean by that is don't let guilt, shame, and condemnation from your past or even who you think you are define you. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from your past, cleanses you from the shame, cleanses you from all of that to make you pure, spotless, and holy. The blood of Jesus is the beginning point of that. Number two, what is true of Christ is imputed to us. And I'm not going to go into the detail in the book, and I'm going to summarize it just for uh, time's sake. Is, but in any covenant that was made, there was a covenant representative in that, in that covenant, this is the way God operates. In that covenant, he selects a representative. Whatever is true of that representative is then imputed or reckoned to be true of everyone who is in that covenant. So when God, we are in the new covenant with Jesus Christ, whatever is true of Jesus, God looks at us and reckons that to be true about us. Jesus is righteous. You are the righteousness of God in him. Jesus has been crucified. You have been crucified in him. Jesus has been resurrected. You have been resurrected in him. That is your legal position in Jesus Christ. See, we are now dead to sin, dead to self, dead to the law, and we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. This is our legal position. What an incredible truth. I meditate on this frequently is because what happens is when you meditate on what Jesus finished for you and who you are in him and what he did, what he did for you on the cross, what happens is when you meditate on that, your faith rises up. Your faith begins to operate. You begin to realize, like Paul said, reckon yourselves. Don't you know that you, that, don't you know when Jesus Christ died, your old man died with him? All that you are in Adam was crucified with Jesus Christ on the cross. Well, why do I still sin? You know, Paul gets into that later, but the, the idea is that don't you know is when he was crucified, you were crucified in him? See, and then Paul says, reckon yourself, consider yourself. Let faith rise up. Let agreement come in your heart that when Jesus died, you died with him. That is an absolute reality in the eyes of God. When Jesus died, you died with him. When Jesus was resurrected, you were resurrected in him. Now, we get into experience a little bit later, but that legal position of seeing it the way God sees it, this is the way God deals with us, causes the faith to rise up, the faith to begin to operate. See, God can't move in our life. God can't bring us into Holy Spirit experience when we don't have faith. If we don't have faith, God can do anything but move in your life when we don't have faith. Jesus could do anything but move in a situation when there was no faith. He couldn't do any miracles 
because of their unbelief. See, what the Lord wants is he wants our faith to be in agreement, our, our mind, our mentality be, to be in agreement with what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. The third thing is that, is that we are justified by faith. And I'm going through a lot of this fast, and I'm going to need to actually go a little bit faster. But you can get all of it in my book in the details. But we need to think about this more and more. We are justified by faith. See, it is as it is if we had never sinned. Justification makes us as if we had never sinned in the eyes of God. See, justification doesn't just pardon you from your sins. Justification bestows upon you a righteous status as if you had never sinned. What an incredible promise that is. The just shall live by faith. That is the truth that sparked the Reformation under Martin Luther, the justification by faith. The third thing is, or the fourth thing is, when we are born again, the Holy Spirit dwells in our spirits that very moment. And I was talking when I was saved, when I was 10 years old, that very moment, I had no language for it. I had no understanding of all that happened. But at that very moment when I was saved, the Holy Spirit, God himself, God himself, the creator of the universe, came into the spirit of this, you know, 10-year-old boy. You have God in you. Wow. You have eaten now of the tree of life. You're, it's as if you had eaten like Adam did from the tree of life. In your spirit, you have the tree of life. See, in your spirit dwells God's glory. In your spirit dwells rivers of living water. In your spirit is resurrection life, creative power, the mind of God, the wisdom of God, the faith of Christ, the person of Jesus Christ is in your spirit. You are one spirit with him. This is all that happened in the finished work of the cross. Number five is we became new creations in Jesus Christ. See, we were made body, soul, spirit. When we are regenerated, when we are born again, your spirit, Ephesians 4.24, became righteous. Not just in legal position, but in actuality. There is, there is a righteous part of you. Let's just say it like this, body, soul, spirit. One third of you is righteous as Jesus is. One third, think about that. Ephesians 4.24, one third of you, I'm talking about your spirit, is just as righteous as Jesus Christ. Just as holy as Jesus Christ. When I first heard this, I thought it was heresy. I started studying it and I was like, oh my goodness. I have believed a lie forever. This is more than a legal position. This is more than a constituted reality. This is a true experience of you. One third of you is just as righteous as Jesus Christ. The work in your spirit is complete. Your, your spirit and the spirit of God are one internally. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one God's not doing a work in your spirit any longer. It's done. It's finished. The work in your spirit is complete. Now, we're going to talk about it in a minute. Well, what is God doing then? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But the reality of this is profound. You are a partaker of the divine nature. Think about that. You have the DNA, the spiritual DNA, of Jesus Christ in your spirit. You are a partaker of the divine nature. That's why Paul looked at the Corinthians and said, you're acting like mere men. You have God living in you, and you're acting like mere men. And you can read more about that in, in the eternal blueprint. But number six is that, that that very reality makes us God's very own children. We are God's children. We are the betrothed bride of Jesus Christ. When we're born again, we become the Father's very own child. 
Man, that's incredible. Forever, God is your father. Forever, he breaks fear and shame off of you and says, you are my child. You are betrothed. You are engaged, so to speak, to Jesus Christ. You are his betrothed bride. See, these truths are so wonderful, you realize, okay, this is why so much of the church never moves beyond the finished work of the cross because it is so glorious. It is so incredible. I mean, you know, you can see why the church just camps out of the finished work of the cross. It is glorious, but that is not the end of the story. The finished work of the cross gets us back to where Adam would have been had he eaten from the tree of life, but there is more. To go into God's ultimate intention, there is more. And that brings us to the way of the cross. See, when, when the Lord told Adam, he said, the day you eat of this tree, the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. But Adam didn't die for another 930 years. And God said, the moment you eat of this, you will die. Well, what happened? Well, if you look at it, man was made body, soul, and spirit. Adam's spirit died. That didn't mean Adam didn't have a spirit. It means that death entered into his human spirit. Death entered into his human spirit. His connection that he had with God, spirit to spirit, communication with God, death entered into that, into him. And then what happened was the, the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, and the body, the five senses, were coupled together together to form what the scriptures refer, refer to as the flesh. And so Adam with a dead spirit, Adam with a soul coupled together with the body, became a man of flesh, what the scriptures refer to as the flesh. And everyone in Adam and everyone born of Adam after that became men and women of the flesh. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. If you came into this world as a human being, you are not just, you are defined in what Jesus says, you are of the flesh. You are, have this edemic nature. What was imparted from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is now in our, in our DNA, is part of who we are. The, the, all that was imparted, the darkness, the pride, basically the nature of Satan was imparted to all of humanity. Pride, selfish, independent, self-willed, all that was imparted at, through the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you, you can just look at your own life and realize, okay, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> I can just look at the, what happened in the tree of life. I can look at myself and I can see, yeah, that's absolutely the truth. Now, because of the finished work of the cross, your spirit was regenerated. Your spirit was born again. Your spirit was raised from death to life. The spirit of God is now one spirit with you. You are one third just like Jesus. That means the two thirds of what God is dealing with is going to be your soul and your body. A lot with your soul. Make sense? Thinking like this just brings the scriptures, makes so much sense of the scriptures. And so the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions were not transformed in our born-again experience. That's why you can have a born-again, regenerated experience, but then you can battle like you battle, like we all battle, and go, I thought I was saved. I thought I was born again. I thought Christ lived in me. I, why would I have these struggles with sin? Well, the problem is, is you're living by your body and you're living by your soul. You're living by the flesh instead of living by the spirit. And so the Lord is jealous to take the salvation that is in your spirit that you presently possess because if you don't possess this salvation right now, if you don't possess eternal life, you are not going to go to heaven. You've got to have the life of God inside of you to enter into heaven. You, it's more than a prayer. It's, it's God living in you. But God wants to take this salvation, Christ in you, in your spirit, and work it out into your soul and work it out 
into your body. And Paul referred to that as working out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we'll, we're going to just quickly talk about three different areas that the way of the cross works in our soul. And you can read about it in the book, but, you know, Paul reveals that we have been saved. I know this is a lot of information, but I'm just trying to give a quick overview. We have been saved. That was in our spirit. We are being saved. That is in our soul. And we will be saved. That is speaking of our body. That's talking about justification, sanctification, and glorification. And so the cross, the way of the cross, works in our soul. See, justification is an instant thing that happens when we're born again. Justification relates to your spirit. Sanctification relates to your soul. And namely, the cross working in your soul so that your self-life in your soul does not block the life of Jesus that now lives in your spirit. And we need the cross to work, don't we? We are so selfish. I am so selfish. We are all so selfish because of Adam, because of the tree. We are self, we are so focused on ourselves that we being, having God, having Christ, having the Spirit of God, having Him in us, our self-life, if not dealt with by the cross, will keep Him suppressed within us. The second thing about the way of the cross is the way of the cross aligns our living condition with our legal position. See, so much of the Christian life is about becoming who we already are. See, who you are in your spirit is meant to go, be worked out into your soul. You are righteous in your spirit. You are to become righteous in your soul. You're right, you're holy in your spirit. You are to become holy in your soul. See, the, the, the working of salvation outward from what God has done in us, that working of that salvation outward See, you have been crucified with Jesus Christ, but you must also put to death your members. You have been crucified with him, but death must also work in your soul and in your body so that you don't let sin reign. And so the way of the cross aligns our legal position or aligns our living condition with our legal position. What God sees us as is meant to become more than a position. It's meant to become a living, experiential reality internally by the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Number three is the cross works to release the fullness of the Spirit within us. The cross works to release the fullness of the Spirit within us. Jesus said that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Watchman Nee was talking about the scripture verse, and he said, there is life in the seed, and there's life in your spirit. But just like that seed, there's a hard outer shell that confines and restricts the life in that seed from popping out and flowing out to release the fullness of life. Your soul, your self-life, your selfishness, your pride, your independence, all that we are in Adam in our soul that has not yet been dealt with takes the life of Christ and keeps that life suppressed so that even though we have the life of Jesus Christ living in us, it has zero effect because we're not letting that one third of us that's saved, that's righteous, that's holy, that's like Jesus, we're not letting that part of us be released into our soul and outward into our body. And so that's why we need the cross. We need the cross to deal ruthlessly with our self-life, don't we? 
you've been in the Lord long enough, you realize I am so selfish. Even the good things I do often are motivated for praise, the praise of men, the glory of man, all this different accolades, whatever, for pride. The Lord starts showing you this and you realize, in my flesh, like Paul said, dwells no good thing. No good thing dwells in my flesh. He wasn't talking about a spirit. He was talking about the, the soul and the body coupled together. There's nothing good in here. That's why we need the cross to work in our mind, in our will, in our emotions, so that de the death of Jesus works into our soul so that the life of Jesus can also work in our soul. And that brings me now to the next, the next point is, well, let's, let's turn now to John chapter 10, verse 10. John 10, verse 10. Is God does not want, as we move towards the ultimate intention of God, for us to be a fully mature Christ-like son, a bride who's made ready, a temple that's possessed by the Holy Spirit, then what needs to happen is the life of God in us needs to be released within us in fullness. Jesus said that I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. See, the Lord came, the Lord's coming was for this very purpose. Just imagine, here it is, the tree of life coming down out of heaven. I came that you would have life. I came that I could impart my life in you in seed form. And that life, that Zoe life of God, the very essence of who God is, that very Zoe life of God in your spirit in seed form is never meant to be a seed and stay a seed. Jesus said it's meant to be such an abundance of life that it overflows out of you. See, some people take this scripture and say, Jesus came to give you an abundant life, meaning that you're going to be blessed and God's going to bless you and God's going to prosper you and all that. That's not what the Lord's talking about. The Lord's talking about his life in you in abundance. That's much better than having a good life. We want his life dwelling in us in abundance. Now, individually, that means that the, the seed of Christ in our spirit is meant to flow out unto fullness so that our soul and our body, the, the, the spirit of God living in us is now giving life to our soul and our body. Jesus said that, or Paul wrote that, if, if the spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of you, he will also give life to your mortal body. He is a life-giving spirit, and he wants the spirit of life in you to flow out of you in fullness. Now, this is not going to end just individually, because God wants a corporate son a mature man uh, of living stones who have the Spirit of God all in fullness. And in other words, the fullness of Jesus Christ as the individual members of the body allow the Lord to fully be released within them and possess them and be Lord in their heart and Lord in their soul, crucifying their independence and their self-life and their pride and the rebellion and all that is of the self-life until Christ is the life that we possess individually, individually and then corporately we then become one body, that mature man that is filled with the fullness of Jesus Christ. That is where the Lord is moving. That's what the Lord is doing. That is what God is moving according to his ultimate intention. So how do we get there? Number one is, is we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to increase within us. He lives in us. And Paul said that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. He's given to you as a down payment of your inheritance. And so just like in a normal you know, mortgage payment, you put a down payment on a house, and then every month you're paying the mortgage and the interest off. Eventually, 20 years, 30 years later, you take absolute possession of your house. That's what God's doing with us. 
the Holy Spirit is the down payment. And as the cross works more and more in our self-life, God is now owning us fully. As the Spirit of God increases in us, as we allow him to have his way, as we say, God, you can have your way in me, as we don't let, we don't hold on to the selfishness and the selfish desires and what we want, as we don't hold on to that, God then is now possessing his house. Just like, he, just like we are when we're paying our monthly mortgage. We're slowly but surely taking ownership of our house so that the, what was deposited at the down payment can then be fully owned by us in 20, 30 years later. That's what God's doing in us. The down payment of the Holy Spirit is, is working. That deposit is working so we can become God's full possession. So we'll allow the Holy Spirit to increase. Sometimes we don't allow him to increase. The second thing is allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in your heart. See, this is an important thing. This is an important thing because God is a heart God. Now, our spirit, if you examine this closely in Scripture, our spirit and our heart are not the same thing. Some people teach that, but it's not true. Hebrews 4.12 makes it clear that the spirit and the heart are different. God is a heart God. God looked at David and he said, or he told Samuel, he said, I don't look at the outward, I look at the inward. I don't look at outward appearance, I look at the heart. God's a heart God. And so when we were born again, that one third of us is saved in our spirit, but our heart, I, I describe the heart as being the channel that connects our spirit to our soul. Our heart isn't filled initially with Christ. And so God wants our heart filled with Christ. See, our, our, our spirit is how we communicate directly with God. We commune with him in our spirit. Intuitively, we know God by our spirit. We know all things in our spirit. And our heart is what I've, after much research and study, the heart is the deepest place of our beliefs desires, motivations, things like that. God's goal is for the Spirit of God in your spirit to dwell fully in your heart. Here's why. It's because Proverbs says that all the issues of life flow out of the heart. So you can have God living in you, but if he doesn't possess your heart, he'll never live his life through you. And that's why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, he said, he said, you know, he said that you might be strengthened in, he was praying for the Ephesians, that you might be strengthened by the power of God in the inner man so that, notice the conditional language of it, so that Christ would dwell in your heart by faith. It's not automatic for Christ to dwell in our heart. It's conditional. And so we want to allow the Lord, by strengthening our spirit, strengthening our inner man, strengthening us by the power of God, we want to, we want to allow the Lord to then dwell in that place in our heart of deep desire, deep belief, deep motivation, so that the Lord Jesus Christ conquers our heart absolutely and fully. Because if we're going to have the fullness of Christ the heart has to be conquered first. And that's what Paul was praying. Finally, number three is don't put any confidence in the flesh. One of the greatest hindrances to the life of God being released in fullness is pride. Pride is one of the greatest hindrances. One of, if you want to know, okay, what's going on in my life? Why is the Lord not increasing? Nine times out of ten, it's going to be something dealing with pride. Paul said, I don't put any confidence in the flesh. I had a reason to, 
I was born on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees, as to the law, blameless. He said, I had every reason and from the externals to put confidence in the flesh. But he said, I don't want confidence in the flesh because I know if I get confidence in the flesh, what will happen is I will not have the fullness of Christ. So therefore, I want to lose and I want to suffer loss of the externals and those things I would glory in and those things I would take pride in. I want to suffer the loss of all things so that I might gain Christ. That's, that's Paul saying that about five years before his death. <laughs> that I might gain Christ. That I might have more of his life released into my soul released into my heart, released into my body so that Christ would possess me. And I want the same thing. I hope you do too. I want the, I, I, I mean, life is so short. Life is, just goes by like a vapor. I want to be possessed by the Spirit of God. I want the life of God filling me that I would just be a man possessed by the Spirit of God. The fullness of Jesus Christ is as much as the fullness of God he will give us in this life. I want that because that is God's ultimate plan and intention. And so just to summarize in closing is the gospel is not God's ultimate intention. The gospel, the work of the cross and the way of the cross are the means to get us unto his ultimate intention, that we would have the life of Jesus Christ in us, in abundance, in fullness, unto full possession, that we could become in this life, carrying over into the next life, the next age, God's very own inheritance a corporate son that's just like Jesus Christ, a worthy bride that has been made ready for her bridegroom, and a temple, a house, a body fully possessed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would make this real in us, Lord.